Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. No doubt you know by now that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the months of April, May, and June of 2014. It's a, a series entitled Christ and His Law, and this is lesson number two in that series entitled Laws in Christ's Day. Try to, in order to try to understand things, you really need to understand some of the context, and so that's what we're going to try to talk about. If you would be interested in getting some of the materials that uh, we use in our discussions here, they're always available at our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. It should be on your screen there. So before we begin, I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to do a lot of looking at the Bible and some, write, some of the writings of Ellen White. Um, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a great privilege to come before you and study your word and ask your guidance, the guidance of your Holy Spirit, as we open the word and as we look at the passages that we may represent you correctly. Forgive us where we have misunderstood in the past. Help us to be a part of that great final movement which will make it possible for you to return to this earth soon, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we always like to mention the context. Think about the fact that this lesson describes how Jesus obeyed the laws that he himself had given in Old Testament times. And he had warned the people through the prophets what would happen if they didn't obey them. And then he comes as a human being, and he obeys them himself. What does that tell us about God? First, what do you mean by obey? Does it mean that he naturally wouldn't do it? No, what? no, 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 not at all. Well, then uh, how o could you go anywhere else? <laughs> yeah. Well, o obey, the, the biblical term for obey in Greek is hupakoe. It means a humble willingness to listen. So he, 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 he understood the purpose of the laws, and he kept them the way they were supposed to be kept. So he did what was right because it was right. That's, that's really what we're talking about. <clears throat> he, wasn't, he wasn't looking for an excuse to, to violate the law. He wasn't trying to, you know, as the Pharisees were always trying to do, figure out a way around the law. He said, this law is right. He, didn't, he should have said... I mean, I don't know why he didn't sometime. Maybe he did, that we don't have it recorded. I would have thought he should have stood up and said, I made these laws. I ought to have the right <laughs> to tell you how to keep them, right? In school, the teachers, I guess they're the lawgivers there. Yeah. They would have the terms, the technical following of the law, mm -hmm. and, and the, um, they didn't say spiritual, but the spirit of the law. Yeah. And they would want people to follow the spirit of the law, um, more of what everybody knew the law meant, rather than trying to skirt around and just follow the technical aspects. Yeah. So did Jesus come to show the spirit of the law as well yes. as the technical? Yes, yes. Well, here's what's happened in our day in, in terms of the law. The Pharisees put up these, we'll talk more about them, so many rules and so many ideas over the years that it was basically impossible. I mean, to try to, I mean, they fasted two days a week, for example. You know, in order to be a Pharisee, it was almost, you almost had to be independently wealthy. It was like a full-time job just to keep the rules. I have a question. Yeah. Can people who have diabetes, can they fast? I mean... Yeah. Yes. Um, in general, yes. It's the, they get a they, problem when they, they get into problems. Well, I mean, they can't, if they're, if they're fast, they can't be taking their insulin and fasting. Yeah. So they need, to, they need to know how to cut their insulin if they're going to fast. But yeah, they can fast. Do you have because, a Pharisee in mind? Well, well, the Pharisees, if they <laughs> fasted two days a week, I'm wondering if there were any diabetics or anything yeah. like that. You, you were a good Pharisee, but you couldn't fast because you had to eat your meals yeah. regularly. Yeah. Well. <laughs> that, that's a modern problem, maybe. Yes. Well, because of the legalism of the Jews, we're talking particularly the Pharisees, many Christians have looked back at Jesus' opposition to their rulemaking, their, all their extra little funny rules, and they basically said, well, 
you know, he must be trying to do away with all those laws and outgo the, the, you know, the rules from the Old Testament, outgo the Ten Commandments as well. And, of course, this has led to anti-Semitism and other atrocities down through the generations. Now, you use the word legalism. Mm -hmm. Exactly what is that? Legalism is a term which has been defined in many different ways, I'm sure, but basically it means operating in your life as if the all-important thing was the law. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you, I mean, if there's a legal reason why I can kill, why I should kill you, I can kill you, and that's what matters. I mean, whether or not it's a good idea. And in a spiritual sense, yeah. the whole life you, around, yeah. In a spiritual sense, you think the idea is if you do these things, then yeah. uh, you find favor with your God, and you're going to be in. Uh, yeah. A good relationship. You're well, going to find favor. I thought it was just <coughs> having a, uh, a need to follow the rules. Well, in, in a sense, yes. So if Jesus followed the rules, was he a legalist? Well, well, hold on. Now, if you if you stay on the right side of the road here in America as you drive down the road, are you being a legalist? Well, you are if you really well, want to. Well, now, this is uh, Gary's question. Am yeah. <laughs> I legalist if I yeah. go on the right side of the road? Right. Take well, if I, to go, if I wanted to go on the left side, really right. bad. Yeah. And then I said, oh, i got to go on the right <laughs> side. Then I would be a legalist. I see. But I, <laughs> okay, well, there, now you've defined the difference in yourself. <laughs> this was drummed into these people from post-infancy. Yeah. And it gets to the point when you're after a while, I'm sure with those folk, it's almost obsessive compulsive. Yeah. I had to do it. Yeah. I, I was wondering about that. You know, if, if I went to England all of a sudden, <laughs> I would still want to right, go on the right side of the road, wouldn't I? Well, but I'll I tell would, you. would I, get I, in trouble. <laughs> I, I have to tell you about my personal experience. I spent many years in Africa where um, almost all the countries I was in Africa uh, I drove on the on the left hand side, following the British rules. Uh, I had some interesting trips where I'd drive on the right hand side and then on the left hand side and the right hand side back and forth between different countries. But my interesting, most interesting experience was a time that um, we were supposed to be flying into South Africa to help with the General Conference Inspection Team to go to some of our hospitals there, and we got delayed out of Los Angeles and we just missed the plane flying out of Miami, so we were a day late. We flew into our destination in Bloemfontein in South Africa just uh, a few hours before we were supposed to leave. And, and, and we were supposed to be at like 500 miles away early the next morning. And the pastor who was supposed to be driving us came to me and he said, do you mind driving? I feel, I'm really tired. So here I was, I ended up, fortunately, you know, my clock was still set on American time, so it wasn't too hard for me to stay awake, but I ended up driving all those 500 miles across the back roads of South Africa on the other side of the road, <laughs> to, making sure, I'm trying to remember to stay where I belong. So I have another question, and, and I'm ignorant on this, but can you define anti-Semitism? Yes, anti-Semitism. The, the word Semitic comes from the, comes from the name of Shem. Yeah. And the Jews are descendants of Shem. Okay, so anti-Semitic would mean that you have something against descendants of Shem, literally. And which, who, who was Shem? Well, sons of Noah. Shem, the, the, one of the three sons of, 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 of uh, Noah. Okay, Shem, so Ham the Jewish uh, people came from one of the sons of Noah, yes. Shem. Ham, Ham's descendants mostly ended up, went into <laughs> Africa. They became the African. And Japheth, his descendants went north and east and west, so people of Caucasian derivatives and, and Chinese and East Indians and so forth, those all derived from Japheth, whereas Shem went south and, and east and some west and filled up, became Arabs and Jews and people from Iraq. To, to Egypt. Okay, I never understood that word, why they said Semitic, yeah. okay, Shem. Okay. Well, last week we talked about how the parents of Jesus obeyed the Roman law and obeyed the Mosaic law as they, they fulfilled their requirements, they paid their taxes, etc. In this lesson, 
we're going to talk about how Jesus himself related to local interpretations of the law. Now remember when you got a, gazoon, uh, a gazillion laws and they don't even all agree with each other, you, you got to start dealing with the interpretations of the law and that's, a, that's an extra challenge. Uh, to many Christians in our century, it might seem obvious that Jesus should have just stood up and said, these are my rules, I wrote them, you know, and this is the way you're supposed to keep them. But he never did that as far as we know. Um, but look at example, for example, in his childhood, look at Luke 2, verses 21 to 24. A week later, when the time came for the baby to be circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name which the angel had given him before he had been conceived. The time came for Joseph and Mary to perform the ceremony of purification as the law of Moses commanded. So they took the child to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, so what are they following? Law of the Lord. The law of the Lord, as it is written, every firstborn male is to be dedicated to the Lord. They also went to offer a sacrifice of a pair of doves or two young pigeons as required by the law of the Lord. Now that's, that's a very significant point because as we, if we, I don't know if we'll have a chance to do this, but if you look back over in the, in the Old Testament where those rules were originally given, what were they supposed to bring? Do you remember? They were supposed to bring a lamb and a dove. But if you were too poor to bring a lamb and a dove, you could bring two doves. So this tells us something important about Jesus' family. They were poor. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be dedicated to the Lord, that your firstborn is dedicated to the Lord? Okay. Um, if it's not too off in, the subject. In, yeah, well, not too bad. Um, <laughs> from the days of Abraham, God had claimed that the firstborn belonged to him. The firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. And so he gave them specific rules, say, okay, if a firstborn son, you have to buy him back by, by giving certain sacrifices. Okay. And certain animals, if you want to keep the firstborn of certain animals, then you have to buy them back. Uh, in the time of the Exodus, um, what happened is God says, instead of taking the firstborn of every family, I'm going to take the Levites. And they get treated as the firstborn for the whole group of people. But that meant the others had to pay back an extra portion to pay for the fact that they were not the firstborn. And so because in the, in the old days, the firstborn was supposed to not only be responsible for the parents, so that's why they got the double portion of the, of the inheritance. They were supposed to care for, they were the social security system. Not only that, but they were supposed to be the priest of the family. They were supposed to be the religious leader in the family. And that was the firstborn male? The firstborn male, yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, there's some very interesting comments about that that uh, you might want to look at if you have a chance. Patriarchs and Prophets by Ellen White, of course. Pages 363 to the top of 364. <clears throat> we don't really know when circumcision first began. In very ancient times, there were two kinds of circumcision. There was a, a, a type that was followed by the Egyptians and by some others where they simply just split the foreskin. And there's a second type called a full circumcision as observed by some of the tribes of Canaan and by Abraham and his descendants where the foreskin, most of the foreskin is completely removed. So why did God first give circumcision to Abraham and his descendants? That's a Here's big a question qu that has really puzzled. a big question. <laughs> a lot of people wonder that. Yes, people are really puzzled about this. Adventists usually take the approach that... Um, it was kind of a health thing. Yes. But wasn't it a sign of their adherence to God? It's something to do with that. Well, it, God told Abraham, I want you to do it as, as a covenant, part of the covenant. So that would be that suggestion. Okay. Well, yeah, so, but the question is, why did, he, yeah. why did he pick that? Why didn't he just say, well, put a ring in your ear or, yeah. you know. Because Abraham was messing around with another woman. <laughs> Didn't it happen after that? After yes, his, it did. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that um, Ishmael was born while Abraham was still uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. Then later, Abraham was circumcised and Ishmael was circumcised and all the men in his, his uh, employee were circumcised. And then Isaac was born when he was uncircumcised. So 
I mean, that, I don't think that makes a huge difference, but it's interesting that one is the son of uncircumcision and one is the son of circumcision, even though Ishmael was circumcised. Um, but the, the reason for that is, uh, the logic behind that it seems to be mysterious as to why. Okay, it doesn't need to be so mysterious, I don't, I don't think. I don't think it's mysterious at all. I think there's a very good reason that most of us never think about. <coughs> They were surrounded by people who were just absolutely consumed by pagan fertility cult worship. And if you went to one of those ceremonies, it was dancing drunk and naked and having sexual orgies and all that kind of stuff. And you couldn't get involved in those ceremonies if you were a Jew without being identified. Well, but you mentioned some of the pagan cultures practice circumcision yeah. as well. so. How you know, the there had to be some of those people running, running yeah, around in the probably. in the cemetery. But at situation. least at least the Jews would be clearly identified. You know they would know. Uh, and I can tell you that after the days of Christ, when when there was some real arguments between um, because remember the Greeks tried to Im impose their culture on everybody. Uh, a lot of the Jews that sort of moved away from their Judaism, for example, down in the city of Alexandria in Egypt, where there were many, many, many Jews down there. Um, they wanted to be involved in the games and so forth, and all the males participated in the athletic games in Alexandria without any clothes on. It was, well, you've seen pictures of the ancient Greeks. You participated without clothes on. And some of the Jews actually went to the extent of trying to I don't know exactly how you do this, but trying to undo their circumcision so they could participate in these games without being so clearly identified as Jews. In the last few years, haven't they found uh, through some of the uh, studies in Africa that uh, less transmission of HIV? Yeah. With, uh, yeah. They, they found that. But HIV is something new. But I mean, who knows? Maybe they had different diseases back there they had to worry <clears throat> about. So that's one of the questions. Well, Gary, you commented about the covenant. Look at Genesis 17, verse 4. I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. And then it goes on to describe some of these things we've been talking about. So it was agreement between God and Abraham. So now, is that covenant still in force? What was the purpose of that covenant? <clears throat> well, As a Christian, is that, does that still... No. <clears throat> the purpose of that covenant was supposed to be the Jews were supposed to be the light to the world. They were set there in Palestine, the crossroads of the then known world between North Africa and, and uh, the Fertile Crescent over Iraq, Iran, and that area. They were at the crossroads there, and they were supposed to be the light to the world. They were supposed to represent God. They were supposed to be converting the world. And they were supposed to be the examples of, of truth and light and all those kind of things. Of course, that didn't happen. So no. there's no covenant today between God and His people? No, but our covenant is different. And what would that be? Well, Christianity involves a whole bunch of things. I mean, it, mean, it means our, co our relationship to God is based on faith, not on physical evidence of some kind, and Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Has yeah. it been God's intent from the start to try to get a people that would represent him. Yes. And from the start, humans just sort of go, no, I'd rather do this, I'd rather do that, I'd rather do this. Do you think the Christians are representing God today? You didn't I mean, need to ask me that. God is still <laughs> trying. God is still trying. If God finally gets a group, even a relatively... But look what he did with 11 disciples. Yeah. I mean, how many does he take at our day of communication, television, radio, internet. I mean, how many does he need? And I'm not trying to say that he could finish the gospel with 11, but, you know, it, 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 you know, it doesn't need, to, I don't think God needs a huge number. He just needs some people, a group of people so committed to the truth that not even the devil himself standing in front of you like this can convince you that, that he's right. That's, and, and there's plenty of quotations from Ellen White just saying that, you know, God can't, God can't bring things to an end because he knows that if he, if he allowed all that to happen, to, so many of us would fall. Now, when, you, when a person enters a covenant, isn't it that 
you have to have two people agree on something. Yes. Um, then how would it extend to their offspring that um, that a baby would be um, circumcised on the uh, eighth day when he really didn't agree to anything? Yeah. But if you if you look at the story, God gave the covenant to Abraham. He repeated it to Isaac. He repeated it to Jacob. Awesome. Same covenant. So I think that's what that was. Go, what God was had planned to do. That was the idea. So Abraham did the agreement for everybody. No, I I, I think it. I think God's idea was that He would repeat it every generation. But obviously things started to fall apart. Not because of God's fault, but because of our fault. Now Isaac was circumcised as a child, a baby. Yes type of thing. Mm -hmm. So then how would he enter an agreement when he was Well, when it, was he, done it wasn't a matter of it wasn't a matter of entering into the agreement at that point in his life. It, the agreement came to him later. But it was passed on by the, yeah. the, the Now, the in the New Testament doesn't God make a covenant that doesn't really require us. He says, "I will write my law into your heart." And it's not like we are going to do anything other than say, "Yes, I would like that." But God doesn't depend on us for um, s promising. We're not even you, supposed to promise God something, are we? Do you, do you know where that promise is given? No. Jeremiah 31. The Old Testament. Right out of the Old Testament. So now for, let's say for a Christian, would, uh, would uh, with the ritual of baptism, would that be kind of yeah. the, uh, yeah. a, a yeah. Christian's replacement for yes. the... Mm -hmm. For the, yeah. uh, for the, it's now, the circumcision is under a, a real criticism today. That yeah. in some places of this country, they've been wanting to outlaw it as, uh, because it's uh, mutilation and and so on and so forth. How, how, Those you're kind of snickering over there as a physician. Oh, <laughs> let, me, let me put it <laughs> to crazy. you this way: as as a retired nurse, I know what kind of elderly male I would rather handle when the chips are down and the poor man is yeah. unable to care for himself. There's only one way to go, and it's not uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. It's circumcision. Mm -hmm. It's healthier. It's cleaner. Yeah. Uh, but it's not everybody. We live in an age where we've got cures for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and these are in the cities, such as San Francisco and others, that uh, would like to get rid of religion. And, and Absolutely. they don't ha pass a law against other types of things they may like to do, but they just want to <laughs> obliterate religion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, let's, let, we, we need to get My back. We, we've talked a lot of interesting <laughs> things here, but we need, we need to get our back. we get back to the lesson? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do we know about the families of Joseph and Mary? <clears throat> Honestly, almost nothing. Yeah. Okay. One of the interesting things is to compare the genealogy of Jesus as represented in Matthew 1 and Luke 3. And between Jesus and, and uh, Solomon, they're almost completely different. And how do you explain that? And it's probably this. Um, if parents, by chance, have only one child and it's a, a female, then when that daughter marries, quite often they would legally adopt the son-in-law as their legal son to carry on their inheritance. Because remember, the inheritance is, their property was supposed to go with that inheritance. So they would adopt the, the son-in-law as their legal son. So it's quite possible, and I, this, we have no way of proving this, but it's quite possible that the genealogy that we have in Matthew is actually the, genealogy, the, the legal genealogy of Joseph, through Joseph, which of course, Joseph had no legal I have no blood connection with Jesus whatsoever. And the one to Luke, who was a doctor and a physician, recognized a little more about the laws of inheritance, he traces his, his genealogy to Mary. That's uh, the most, uh, most likely explanation for that. In the beginning of that passage for the genealogy, it says that some people suppose yeah. that yeah. it came from Joseph. Joseph. Yeah. So it there's does. kind Luke, of a Luke cue, cue there that there's... Yeah. Well, we're told that Joseph was a righteous man. Mary was found favor in the sight of God. What, what do you suppose that means? Their hearts were good. They were good people. If you were the king of the universe, how would you go out looking 
for someone to be your parents? Mm. Would you pick out an unmarried teenage girl? I think God did it deliberately. If you follow the the uh, other lineage clear back to um, uh, through Ruth and so forth, he just all conventions were done away with. It's just those that are willing to follow him. That's all that mattered, no matter what their blood. Uh, and and line the interesting was. thing is that God, God clearly knew exactly far in the future what was going to yeah. happen. Because if you look at the story of Tamar and you look at the story of Ruth and you look at the story, you know, you go down through that, you know. Rahab and so forth. I mean, those women are about the only ones who get their stories told in the Old Testament. And why? They ended up being ancestors of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to Lot, Lot's wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, Lot's wife is dead, and here uh, Lot, they get Lot drunk and his two, two daughters, uh, uh, and then one of them becomes a part of the lineage of Jesus. Who would have picked that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that Solomon wasn't really in the line. That's where it split, right there after David. Yeah, the line went to what, Nathan? Was well, Nathan? Uh, he had a whole bunch of kids, and so it went through two different parts of that line. Well, yeah, I mean, Joseph went through the Solomon part, but yeah. Nathan w was his brother no, no. or something? No, 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 it, no. Not Nathan, but... It, yeah, was a, it was a son of Solomon. They both go through Solomon and through David, both of them. Yeah, go back and look at those. They both do. So, it so splits after Solomon. It, um, it's, splits Solomon. After Solomon. it's Solomon's children that go. I, I read it. I didn't see Solomon's name in the Luke sign. Yeah, they're there. Be, being of low lineage and not higher up, that got rid of an argument for later on that could have been used against him, wouldn't it? As far as mm -hmm. belief. Well, you had an edge on us because you were up, you had purer blood in the line, but he was poor. Rock yeah. bottom, you might say. Yeah, exactly. So now what's this got to do with uh, the laws of Jesus' day, whether Mary or Joseph or... I'm going to try to see answer uh, Gary's question here real quick. If you look in Luke 3, I think I can spot it here without taking too much time. <coughs> um, uh, da, 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 da. 31, Nathan, the son of yeah. David. Yeah. Well, it says, okay, so it was, you're right. It was just before I didn't want to mislead someone. Um, well, I, I, I saw that in a parallel Bible book, so I, uh, it was a little bit. Nation, the son, sure. of, the son of Edmund, the son of the army, and the son Photographic of Photographic, Mom? The son of Jacob, the son of Salmon, Obed, David, okay, the son of Nathan, the son of David. Okay, so it was it split after David. Now, I don't want to mislead anybody. I'm sorry. It was there might be some significance to that because you know who um, Solomon's mother was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, according to Daniel 9 and the Gospels, the ministry of Jesus lasted three and a half years. It began in the autumn of AD 27. It ended with the crucifixion in the spring of AD 31. If we had only the synoptic Gospels, which are the synoptic Gospels? Mark and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's right. It would appear that Jesus' only visit to Jerusalem uh, during, that, during the time of his ministry was at the end of his life, just before his crucifixion. However, the Gospel of John clarifies that Jesus made several visits to Jerusalem. In fact, John focuses almost entire, his entire Gospel on what happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. So if you want to know about what Jesus did in Galilee, you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you want to know what Jesus did in Jerusalem, you read John, okay? The events of Jesus' first Passover visit are recorded during his ministry, I guess I should add there, were recorded in John 2 and 3, the cleansing of the temple and the talk with, with uh, Nicodemus and so forth. Events of the Passover associated with the second Passover recorded in John 5, where he healed the blind man. The third Passover occurred following the feeding of the 5,000 in Galilee, as recorded in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6, Jesus did not attend that Passover. And of course, the, pass, the fourth Passover was the time when he went up and was arrested and killed. Now, did Jesus attend these Passovers because it was required by, did it, was it required by Bible law? Was it by, by the Pharisee law? Or 
If you lived within a short distance of Jerusalem, you were expected as a male to attend every major festival. Was that in the Bible or was that in? That's, that's from, that's, yeah, I think that's from the okay. Bible, yeah. yeah. Um, where, of course, we know that Jesus attended one Passover earlier, didn't he? At the age of 12. And probably at that time experienced what we call a bar mitzvah. Um, went back and lived with his parents and, and they apparently went up to Jerusalem at least once a year and Jesus no doubt went with them many times. So what we're tracing here is how Jesus conformed to the, um, yeah. uh, the customs and the, uh, and the, yeah, exactly. you know, the biblical laws. So how many festivals were there every year in Jerusalem? Four or six or a lot. Well, there's, there's three main ones that are spelled out in the Old Testament, and then there's two more. Let's talk about those very briefly. The first one occurred in the springtime, late in March, early April, known as the Passover followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The second one, known in Hebrew as Shavuot, and, but in much more commonly, at least in Western cultures, known by its Greek name, Pentecost, occurs in June, 50 days. Penta means Pentecost is 50 so it means 50 days later. And it was followed then in the early fall, September, October, by the Day of Atonement, otherwise known as? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, Kippur yes. Now, are you the saying... The Day of the Lid. And that's followed by the Feast of Booths, yes? Are you saying that Pentecost was a Jewish um, right. holiday? Yeah. Right. I never realized that. Yeah, Pentecost. <coughs> okay. Okay, and, and then Yom Kippur was the end of the Jewish year, and then the Feast of, of um, Tabernacles began the New Year. So that was the, the New Year for, for Jews. Well, there was two other ceremonies, and I don't want to get too buried in history here, but it's interesting. Jews celebrate even today two other major festivals. One is the <coughs> Feast of Purim, and what, where did Feast of Purim come from? Out of Esther, wasn't it? The time of Esther. And why, what does Purim mean? Purim is the word for lots. Remember they cast, Haman cast lots to decide which day the Jews were going to die? <coughs> so this is the day of the lots, the Feast of Purim. And that's uh, late February. Um, and of course it's the, the, the story of Queen Esther and how she saved the Jews from genocide. And then of course the other one is the Jewish equivalent more or less of our Christmas, Hanukkah. And it celebrates what? It says here, Maccabees over the Greeks. Yeah, yeah, yes, right. the Jewish people. When Antiochus IV Epiphanes came through Judah in, on his way back from one of the wars with the Egyptians, he decided the time would come to in, him, for him to enforce Greek religion on the Jews. And he came into Jerusalem and he went into the temple and he tore down all their symbols and he sacrificed a pig on the altar and put up a, a statue of, a, of Apollo, the Greek god, and so forth like this. And he said, from now on, we're going to get rid of this crazy Jewish religion. You're going to worship only the true religion, which is our Greek religion, and so forth. And they tried to enforce that with a heavy hand. And about three and a half years later, more or less, um, <laughs> the Jews under, under the Maccabean family uh, rose up and, and got rid of the the, um, throughout the, the Greek influence and went back to their worshiping according to their Jewish traditions. Um, well, that was some family. Yeah. There was a father and seven sons. Yeah, quite oh. a history. Yeah. You can read about them, of course, in the books of Maccabees. The first Maccabees is much more historical than second Maccabees, but it's an interesting book. Good um, for them. Well, how many people came to the Passover and what did they do there? Big deal. It was a big deal. Yeah, early on, we don't really <laughs> If you lived in Galilee, it would take about a week to walk to Jerusalem. They usually would try to get to Jerusalem about a week in advance to prepare everything. Then it was a, week t a week's time for the actual ceremony, and then a week to walk back. So you're talking about four weeks, almost a month, if you went for one of these festivals. Of course, in those days, these were kind of family vacations. Yes, yeah, they were. But you have to leave your farm. Yeah. And your carpenter shop, so forth. Well, um, 
Remember, there's another thing that sometimes people forget. It was only at Jerusalem that you could offer a sacrifice supposedly for dealing with your sins. You couldn't do this at the synagogue in Galilee or Capernaum or Nazareth, those places. If you wanted to offer a sacrifice in atonement for your sins, you had to come to Jerusalem to do it. And if you lived in Rome, you, had to, you still had to travel to Jerusalem to do it. That was the only legal place where you could offer your sacrifice. So in uh, one, about 10 years after Jesus died, someone tried to make an estimate of how many people came to Passover to offer sacrifices. It was something over 2 million. Try to imagine taking 2 million sacrifices. Well, it's completely, there's no possible way they could deal with it. If you go back and think of all they had to go through. So they made a rule, at least I don't know how lo when and how long this rule sufficed, but the rule was 10 people would have to come together and offer one sacrifice. Well, that saved a little on the money, but it still was a, I mean, imagine trying to sacrifice 200,000 animals, you know, you know, in a week's long period of time. And I mean, the blood would flow like something. The smoke. Be like a slaughterhouse. Well, Another comment about Jesus in the temple, and we're, gonna, we're getting into the meat of our discussion here. Look at Luke 2, 49. And we should look at this, um, we should look at it first in the King James Version, because that's what a lot of people have learned in their younger days. Um, hold on, we're not getting a... Just a second here. I need to... There. Well... Why is my King James? Shall I read what you have down here? Oh yeah, finding my, 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 my program didn't work right at first, but here it is. Um, and I'm reading from Luke 2, verses 48 here, 49. Um, and when they saw him, this is Jesus' parents, after be, losing track of him for three days, they come back to Jerusalem, they find him. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And, I mean, that doesn't sound very respectful, does it? Did Jesus know that his father was someone other than Joseph at that time? Well, it turns out that the King James uh, wasn't quite familiar with the, 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 the grammar of, of, and, and the idioms of the Greek of Jesus' day. This is the way it should sound. I'm reading from my Good News Bible. He answered them, well, let me just back up, 48. His parents were astonished when they saw him, and his mother said to him, what was he doing, remember? Talking to the priests. He was in the temple. Yeah discussing with priests, asking them questions they couldn't answer, and he was providing answers for them. Seems to me this would tie back in on your earlier questions about his knowledge of the law. If he was yes. old enough at 12 to argue, with, talk or argue, he had with to alre rabbis. already figured out what was right and what was a show that exactly. he'd been tested. Yep. So, and his mother said to him, my son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been terribly worried trying to find you. He answered him, why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? I've got but they the, did not understand his answer. I've got the English Standard Version. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Yeah, yeah exactly. So what is he really trying to say to them? I'm getting he's, out my business. Yeah, he's, he was saying, I have recognized now who my real father is. We don't know how much he was teased, what was said about him when he was a kid, about his parentage and so forth, so we don't know what the background behind that was, but clearly by age 12, he, he knew uh, who his real father was. Uh, and I can tell a brief story that I've mentioned before, but I always, always have to smile when I think about this. There's a story told about a, a black pastor in the south, southern part of the United States who was talking about Jesus and his in his visit to the temple here, the same story. And according to this black pastor, the rabbi said, son, how old are you? And to which, according to this black pastor, uh, hesitate, Jesus hesitated for a moment. He said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> I like that. So what does it teach us about God to recognize that Jesus was willing to enter the womb of a sinful woman, 
contradiction to the idea of immaculate conception, to be born in a stable, <clears throat> to live with a humble and poor human family, eat with them, sleep with them, obey them as far as possible, giving his divine mandate, and put up with all their human eccentricities for years. Why would God do that? That shows an extreme love. That's a pretty deep question. Kind of hard yeah. to answer that here. That's why I asked it. <laughs> well, how else could he do it? That's well, what was he trying to do that had to be done in that way? For well, him to fully appreciate what it was like to live on this earth as it was then, he had to have done that. Is it that God didn't know what it was like to live as a human being, or was it somebody else had a problem? Show everybody else. Yeah. His main purpose was to show us, because the devil had claimed that no one living on this earth as a human being could live out his entire life without sinning. So Jesus had to do that. And if he came as a rich man, the devil would have said, uh, you had too many privileges. Yep. What did the Jews actually expect from the Messiah when Jesus came? Look at this quotation from Bizarre of Ages, page 457, paragraph 2. It was generally believed that Christ would be born at Bethlehem because of Matthew 5, I'm sorry, because of uh, Micah 5, verse 2, but that after a time he would disappear, and at his second appearance, none would know whence he came. There were not a few who held that the Messiah would have no natural relationship to humanity. And because the popular conception of the glory of the Messiah was not met by Jesus of Nazareth, many gave heed to the suggestion, Howbeit we know this man whence he is. But when Christ cometh, when the Messiah cometh, no man knoweth, knoweth whence he is. So Jesus was constantly battling their wrong ideas, their wrong traditions. Where did they get these wrong ideas? Oh, well, they got these wrong ideas from a misinterpretation of the Old Testament. Yeah. If you think about it, it's kind of the same thing that happened to him. He, he's left again. Mm -hmm. When he comes back, yeah. where did he come from? Yeah. So I'm talking about the second coming. Yeah. Well, look at Matthew 17, starting with verse 24. When Jesus and his disciples came to Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked, Does your teacher pay the temple tax? Of course, Peter answered. When Peter went into the house, Jesus spoke up first. Simon, what is your opinion? Who pays duties or taxes to the kings of this world, the citizens of the country or the foreigners? The foreigners, answered Peter. Well then, replied Jesus, that means that the citizens don't have to pay. But we don't want to offend these people, so go to the lake, drop a line in. Now, how was Jesus, how, what was Peter's normal way of fishing? Net. 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 He says, go to the lake, drop a line in, pull up the first fish you hook, and in its mouth you will find a coin worth enough for my temple tax and yours. Take it and pay them our taxes. So what's happening here? They couldn't have got him for tax avoidance. <laughs> Put it bluntly. Okay. So Jesus was saying, follow the laws of the land? Yes. These were laws he gave. <clears throat> These, this was the half shekel tax that every Jewish male was supposed to pay. Oh, this was a church tax, not this a state tax. This is a church tax. tax. Some people say, make sure that the hill you die over is worth it. Mm -hmm. and it to me, when I read that, I think that Jesus didn't, it, it wasn't worth fighting over. And so he goes out and he does this miracle and answers both questions at the same time yeah. and, and keeps the argument from, from happening. Well, so, so their idea was if he didn't pay, they would say he's not obeying the law. He's, he doesn't believe in the law of Moses. If he does pay, they're going to say, okay, we, we have our law. Now, this is, not, this is not God's law. This was their law that rabbis and priests and Levites and these special class of people didn't have to pay. So they were going to say, according to their rules, if he pays it, well, obviously he recognized that he's not of the upper, cra upper crust because he pays the tax. So they thought it was one of those cases where they thought they had him going either way. There's no way. So what happens? The fish paid the temple tax for him. The fish paid the temple tax for him? Well, he paid a tax for himself and Peter. Okay, Peter did the paying. Jesus didn't do any paying. But it was for Jesus and for Peter. 
And so if they wanted to try to accuse him, they, people would have to say, well, where did he get the money? And <laughs> then they, they lose their whole punch, don't they? Everybody will start going fishing in that lake. Yeah. <laughs> you can read about this in Desire of Ages 432 through 433 and up to 434. It's a very an interesting story. I'm going to try and pay my taxes that way. Y yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you have to catch a well in this country. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about it? Did, Mo did Jesus seek to overthrow the laws as given by Moses and the others in the Old, Tes in the Old Testament? Some of them. <clears throat> Jesus said, remember, Matthew 5 says, I'm here to establish the law. Mm -hmm. So what laws was he overthrowing? Those that were wrong, and, and what, he detested the hypocrisy. The uh, man-written laws? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's look at some examples. Um, the, the the story the the most interesting story or another story a very good story is the story of the woman caught in adultery. It's found in John eight. Uh, I'm going to read it. Well, I don't think it'll take too long. Um, it, you really need to start with the last part of, of John seven fifty three. Then everyone went home that the night before, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and apparently he slept that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery, and they made her stand before them all. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death. Now what do you say? They said this to trap Jesus so they could accuse him, but he went bent over and wrote on the ground with his finger. As they stood there asking him questions, he straightened himself up and said to them, Whichever one of you has committed no sin, notice those very significant words, may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. When they heard this, they all left one by one, the older ones first. Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened himself up and said to her, Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir, she answered. Well then, Jesus said, I do not condemn you either, but, go, but do not sin again. Now, it's a very familiar story. What are we supposed to learn from that? It's recounted in Desire of Ages, pages 460, uh, the bottom of the page, the top of 462. Um, it's very interesting that John 8, verse 9 says, Then he bent over again and rolled on the ground, when they heard this, they all left one by one, the older ones first. What does that tell us? Had they committed more sins? Well, that's one possibility. It was in alphabetical order. It was the oldest ones. The oldest. <laughs> yeah. Why? But why? why? Were they There's wiser? a very important reason why it's like that. The older ones were supposed to be the saints, right? And it's important to recognize that they left one by one, the oldest first, because what does that tell you about what was being written in the dust? They were all as bad as each other. Well, not only that, he, just, he didn't write just some general rule about, yeah. the, about the Pharisees. He wrote their specific sins right, yeah. in there. Just, just like he knew at the lady at the well that she had more than one husband. Exactly. He was writing down the specific sins of, of he knew what these guys had done, and he was writing it right out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we don't, you, you know, we chuckle about that, but he probably wrote in cryptic enough language so that it's probably only the person who he was directly addressing that knew, oh boy, he knows about that. It's time for me to get out of here. By the way, um, he said, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. Who was the only one without sin there? Him, Jesus. Jesus was the only one there without sin. And he decided not to do it. He didn't. Didn't need to. People often stop, though. Uh, he told her, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. People often stop it, forgive, and let the person continue doing what mm -hmm. they're. But he said, go and sin no more. So let's talk about another, another time when Jesus deals with one of their rules. 
Matthew 19, verses 1 to 9, we're not going to have time to read this whole thing. But the Pharisees come and say, you know, here are these, all these people, they're married to one, one uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, does, they asked him, does our, our law allow a man to divorce his wife for whatever reason he wishes? Now, what, was the, what were the rules in those days? Deuteronomy 24. You mean with divorce? Yeah. Dismiss your You could wife. dismiss your wife, but you had to give her a, a, a certificate saying, this woman was legally married to me, she was my wife, and I have sent her off. So that she had a legal basis for being single again. Okay. Could she get remarried again with that certificate? That was what was supposed to be possible, yes. And if you go back to Deuteronomy 24, what gives the original instructions, it's very clear that she would not be allowed to come back and marry the, same, the first husband again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, what was that all about? What, what are we supposed to learn from that? What did Jesus do? He says, you go back to Moses, let me beat you one. I'll go back to, Abra I'll go back to Adam. How many wives did Adam have? One. How many God did God intend for Adam to have? One. Okay. So he said, and then the reason you have this problem with divorce is because of what? The hardness of your heart and the stiffness of your neck. Okay. Now, Jacob had two wives. Jacob had four. I know he did. He had, but he had two wives. The other ones were kind of their yeah. slave type of thing. Now, those two wives produced the twelve. That's right. The twelve. The well, twelve the four tribes. Wives. The four wives produced the twelve. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that. <laughs> All right. Now, um, so we've got a legacy of two wives producing this. And clear down to the um, Revelation where you have the 144,000. They're still connected to that. Yes. So, um, isn't there some significance to that? When you said that um, you're supposed to have only one wife, mm -hmm. why is it that um, you let this, this two go all the way through? Hardness of your heart and stiffness of your neck, is that what they said? Does that mean you rewrite my rules? What, what God is telling us there is, okay, I'm going to reach down and I'm going to relate to you and I'm going to work with you no matter what a big mess you make of things. Now remember that this, having these four wives was not Jacob's idea. Let's be honest, we have to be fair to Jacob. This was not his idea. He had in mind being married to one woman. That's right. He was tricked. And the one he had, he had in mind to marry wasn't the one he was buried with. Yeah, Leah but it was buried with him. The, the oh, other one was buried with him. Yeah, yeah the, the other one was buried. That's interesting a too. A long time so earlier, yeah. Um, she, the one he wanted to be married to was, <laughs> was died and was There's buried. some significance so there. Even to, I don't think everybody's looked at that yet. Even today, God can work with our messed up lives. And he can, right. he can, he can weave good into it. By the way, what do you think would have happened, that, go, jumping back to our story from John 8 again real quick. You know, Jesus could very well have written in, with his finger in the stone. He did that at the top of Mount Sinai, didn't he? He wrote the Ten Commandments in stone. What if Jesus had written the sins of those <coughs> Jewish leaders in the stone? The message of forgiveness the wouldn't temple be... Foundation. What, what, would be, what would be the most popular tourist site in the whole country? Yeah. <laughs> But still, still, it's, there's a message of forgiveness there yeah. because the, the sands can be blown away, whereas the stone stays. So. Okay. So, uh, let us just review the very important, why did Jesus need to live his whole life sinless? Why was that really important? To demonstrate. To demonstrate <coughs> that Satan was wrong. To answer Satan's accusations that no human being can live a sinless life. Now, only one person needs to do it, because if you make, a law, you make a law that says nobody can do it, and one person does it, what does that do? It disproves the, the claim, disproves right? The so, um, and there's lots of things about this. A, a famous passage on this is, if you know the book Sermons and Talks, you know, Volume 2, 
page 194, paragraph 3, Great Controversy, 531, paragraph 1, Desire of Ages, 239, paragraph 3, and so forth. Um, so, if Jesus, as the giver of all these rules, nevertheless found it appropriate for him to obey all the real rules, not all their fuddy-duddy rules, but the real laws from, from the Old Testament, what is, what's that trying to tell, what's that to say to us? Are God's rules sort of optional? No. Doesn't sound like it. God, apparently well, those rules the, are there. If those rules don't really save us, then how can you answer that question now? Well, but can you save, can you be saved? With, not, not that the rules, see, the, you asked the, the wrong the question. Rules don't, the rules don't save anybody. That's so right. Why is but it, can you save, be saved without the rules? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think God's don't because be you're sure. saved no. by the don't promise. Be too sure. If yeah. you if you set about to break all of God's laws, no, 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 I didn't say okay, that. Okay, well, okay, I didn't say that, but I didn't say that you're you're doing the rules either. Yeah. So. Okay. So. <laughs> God's rules are sort of like gravity. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're talking about is what you mentioned earlier, Joanne. Do we agree with the spirit of the law? It's not so much the letter of the law that matters. Do we agree with the very spirit, the basic ideas inherent in God's laws? Look at this quotation from Ellen White. All too often the law, and the lawgiver for that matter, seems to receive bad press. Many people see that Jesus of the New Testament is kind and forgiving while viewing the God of the Old Testament as a stern, heavenly policeman with a list of laws that he tries vigorously to enforce. We forget that the entire Godhead, the Trinity, and it's particularly Jesus because he's the one who does this, authored the whole system of law in the Old Testament. Jesus modeled a life based on the law, and it was only by his Holy Spirit's power that the first Christians could follow Jesus' example in applying God's laws to their everyday lives. And that's out of our Bible study guide, the teacher's Bible study guide at page 25. And one more, it is a sophistry of Satan that the death of Christ brought in grace to take the place of the law. The death of Jesus did not change or annul or lessen the slightest degree the law of the Ten Commandments. And I don't have time to read the rest of that. Uh, we know how much people have tried to set aside God's law, but the example of Jesus teaches us those laws are there for, the reason, for a reason that we should follow them. See you next week.